Good morning, 11 o'clock, first Sunday of the month, Superior College, Stanford Chai and White. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a pleasure to welcome Jay Deshmukh, our speaker today. But before that, in case you're listening to this online, please remember to type in your questions uh, in the YouTube chat. We'll try and take them, we'll monitor the call. Uh, audience here, uh, please remember that uh, this is mainly for you, so please ask questions. Please repeat the questions that they ask so that the online audience knows what it is. And uh, this is an experiment, online audience. We are trying to do this uh, from a mobile phone today. There is no Wi-Fi in the college here. There's some exam and everything's turned off. Uh, so uh, let's hope it works. Uh, so on that note, uh, also remember that for those who are joining in new and for the audience here, Jaima happens on the first Sunday, first Sunday, if a month has a fifth Sunday, a fifth Sunday. However, next Sunday, there will be a special online Chai and Y because it is apparently the defined week for the IFR to do activities under Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. So we will have a special live from the lab Chai and Y next Sunday. Our details will be online tomorrow. Our next standard session is the first Sunday of the month, which is going to be at uh, the Nithvi Theatre, September 4th. And there, Sneha is going to look at the world of mitochondria. They are supposed to be the powerhouse of the cell, but they have lots and lots of other functions in the cell as we are discovering right now. So join us at the theater uh, on September 4th for mitochondria. Uh, with that introduction, it's time to introduce uh, Jay Deshmukh. Jay is a PhD student at the IFR in the group that does essentially uh, quantum measurement and control, quantum computing, etc. Uh, Jay did his uh, bachelor's and master's in physics from IIT Kanpur uh, before joining us about four years ago, I think. Uh, yeah, so over to you, Jay. Uh, Jay, as of now, this is some Zugad arrangement. So uh, uh, speak loudly so that this camera can capture you. That's the mic we use right now, I think so. Should we just confirm? Yeah, can you check on YouTube with audio? Yeah. No, no, but can you check with audio? Yeah. Good. Okay, it's good. So whichever mic, it's either this mic or that mic, I don't know which one is default. Yeah, so probably this one. Probably, probably this one, we forgot to connect the Bluetooth, but it's okay. So over to you, Jay, all yours. I will get on with it. Thanks a lot, Anwar. Good morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure speaking to you all. And uh, today I'm going to speak a little about uh, some systems which we now understand and can create and create. Yeah, and these systems allow us allow us to have a peek into this very interesting world of quantum mechanics. And it's the right as a sequence of really cool electronic circuits. But what do I mean by the term quantum mechanics? Well, quantum mechanics is nothing but uh, a mathematical theory which describes the physics at the microscopic scales. The physics of real world objects, which we see around us, like a cricket ball or cars or trains, uh, that physics is something which we now call classical mechanics. And uh, it turns out that this, this theory, which so precisely explains that all of the phenomena in the real world around us, it uh, spells quite spectacularly when we try to apply the same rules in, at the microscopic level. But uh, how did we figure this out in the first place? So let's see that. So let's start by talking about classical objects. So these are objects which follow Newton's laws or Newtonian mechanics. And given the information of the initial, the initial state or the initial velocities and the information of the forces they, they experience, we can calculate precise trajectories of these objects using the equations in motion. So physicists tried to explain atoms using these same rules. So at this point, we already knew that atoms are made up of charges, like positive and negative charges or more precisely, protons and electrons. So they imagine this picture where all of the protons are clumped together at the center, like a nucleus, and the electrons essentially move around them in some bit trajectories, much like how planets move around the sun. Now there was a very uh, fundamental problem with this, uh, with this imagination. The problem is that the theory of electrodynamics, which describes how, uh, how charges uh, behave in the presence of electric fields and magnetic fields, that theory tells us that any charge which accelerates, it radiates energy. So that means that if an electron has to move around in a circular motion around the nucleus, it has to accelerate towards the center. And if it accelerates towards the center, it will emit radiation. 
and that means that it will eventually lose energy as it moves and finally collapse into the nucleus. Now that is something which obviously doesn't happen because we're not here. So that is one fundamental problem. The other problem is that if we actually observe this energy which the atom uh, is, uh, or the electron is releasing, there's no reason for it. Uh, so we would expect it to release energies, uh, all of the uh, light of all energies, or equivalently light of all frequencies. So in principle, if we took uh, a gas of atoms and we measured the light coming from it, we would expect to see the entire spectrum. But in experiment, what physicists noticed was something rather shocking. They noticed that they took, uh, let's say, a gas of hydrogen or helium and observed the spectra. They saw these very discrete and sharp lines and not the entire spectrum. And this really surprised everyone. And this could only imply one thing. That the electrons around the nucleus, they are not allowed to have all energies. They are allowed to have only specific energies, and these lines correspond to the transitions the electron makes between these discrete levels. Now, this shook the entire community, and uh, it uh, it really implied that we had to reformulate the entire uh, you know our, our entire understanding of physics, and we had to come up with a new theory which could explain all of these or this and some more uh, some more experiments which did not follow what we expect. So there were these multiple observations, this is one of them. So this new theory had to explain these observations. And at the same time, it had to be consistent with everything that we knew about the classical world. So this was a huge uh, endeavor, and this was uh, completed by some of the brightest physicists that we know of. And finally, we came up with a theory, which we now call quantum mechanics, which not only explains all of these uh, uh, all of these uh, strange phenomena to observe, but at the same time, it predicts phenomena which we could have never imagined with a classical intuition. So it turns out that electrons in an atom, they are not described by classical mechanics, but they are described by something called a Schrodinger equation. Now this equation, which is a, we don't need to understand what it means, all we need to appreciate it is that it completely captures this discreteness of energies which we observe. And uh, it turns out that we can no longer imagine the electron as a point-like particle moving around the nucleus. The information, the, the electron is rather described by something called a wave function, which only contains the information of the probability of finding the electron at a particular position in the atom. So for example, these are some particular wave functions. Uh, so this, this so, so there's a particular wave function of the electron corresponding to all of the allowed energies from in the atom. So for example, this is very symmetric. So the, how, how bright the wave function is represents how probabilistic it is, or the, the brighter it is, the more probability of finding the electron at that place. So we had to give up this whole uh, idea of particles having precise trajectories and positions to actually explain this. Matter. So just to summarize, there's a particular wave function corresponding to electrons. And these wave functions convey the probability of finding the electron at any point. So, so now we have this theory which can explain these observations. And uh, it also predicts, and we have observed these other strange phenomena which are only accessible in this quantum mechanical world. So, since I'm going to eventually talk about quantum computing, I think it's, it, is, uh, it would be helpful to introduce some standard vocabulary at this point. So we know how normal computers work, I'm assuming. The fundamental building block is called a bit. A bit represents two states, D1, 1, 1, and we use these two states to encode information. So we came up with an idea that, oh, I have these discrete levels. So let's say I pick two of them. I pick two discrete levels. I can use these two discrete levels to encode my information in much the same way as I use a bit. So I can use this energy level or this wave function to represent my state 0, and this wave function to represent my state 1. And this idea is powerful in a particular This idea is powerful because uh, when we encode information in this way and try to do computations, we can, we can exploit some phenomena which are only accessible in this quantum mechanical world. Uh, and we can exploit this phenomena to do computations in a more efficient way. Now, we will appreciate eventually what that is. But one of these phenomena is called superposition. So this is a schematic or a representation of classical bit, which can only uh, take these two dis distinct values, 0 and 1. The quantum equivalent of a bit, or the quantum analog of a bit, 
quantum bit or which is also known for q bit uh, can be can have these two states z1 and 1 like the two wave functions i uh, i pointed towards in the last slide but what's special is that this qubit can also exist in a state which is a superposition of these two so it can have characteristics of both the zero state and the one state and it can be represented with this picture which is called a block sphere so you can imagine it as a globe where the north pole and south pole represent your zero and one state and any other point on the earth is also an allowed state of this qubit and that is a particular linear superposition of these two states. And this is a mathematical concept. There's very complete mathematical backing to these ideas. But all we need to understand at this point is that it can exist in a state where it has characteristics of both of them. So what did you call this here? I called it the block sphere. Block. Block. B L O C H. B L O C H, not C, not K. B L O C H, yes. Yes. Yeah. Let me just go back. This. Yes. This. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so if, since energy is discrete. Oh, okay. So these are two. Okay. So the question is that here I'm saying that the energies are discrete. Whereas on the block sphere, I'm seeing that these states are continuous and uh, they, they can be on any point on the sphere. Okay, that's a great question. So these are two different concepts. Uh, the energy is being discrete implies that the energies which your system is allowed to have uh, are discrete. And uh, so these are something called uh, eigen energies. I mean, it's, it's jargon, but what that means is that uh, uh, so when you actually observe the energies of these systems, these are the only observations of energies that you will make. But there is this other one, like which is which is uh, uh, so when a state is in superposition, which is in a superposition of many of these energies. When you make a measurement, the superposition kind of dies, and you finally measure only one of these energies. And that depends on which state it is in. So there's a particular mathematical way in which you can compute the probability of either measuring the energy related to zero or related to one. So, so yes, that's right. That in the superposition state, your energy is kind of not well defined, or it's it's uh, it's not discrete in the same sense as we expect it to be. But when you actually make the measurement, it will you will only measure discrete energies. So it will change only when you measure. Like that, yeah. But the moment you want to measure it, yes, it will be going to discrete. Yeah. So is it correct in saying that the energies are discrete, but the superposition is not of energy, the superposition is of wave functions? Yes, that's right. Now, wave functions are not discrete, wave functions are wave functions. They are they only when you make a measurement on a wave function, do you measure a particular energy and then you measure one of these energies. Right, but but yeah, that's right. And uh, in general, a quantum particle can exist in a superposition of these wave functions as well. So related to the ideas are concerned in this process, you cannot measure that in time where measure only at a discrete point. So so that is a slightly yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Well. Okay, just, just to summarize the answer, yes, it is a superposition state, but when you finally make the measurement, you will only measure state zero or state one. So in that sense, it is this. Thanks for the question. Uh, right, so now let's go to, so, so we, we compared one classical bit to one quantum bit or a qubit. Now let's talk about more number. So let's say you had three bits. So I'm just listing out uh, the number of, number of configurations which are allowed to have, uh, which are allowed for you. So let's say we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, and we can list out all of these allowed configurations. And when we count them, you will realize that the number of allowed configurations is 8, which happens to be to the power 3. If we do the same activity for 4 bits, you can try it, you will realize that the number of allowed configurations is 16, which happens to be to the power 4. And in general, if you have n bits, the number of allowed configurations is 2 to the power n. 
So this means that the number of cloud configurations grows exponentially with the number of bits. Now, instead of n bits, if you had n quantum bits, you could prepare these, these n qubits in a, in a particular quantum state where they are a superposition of all of these two to the power n allowed states. So as in the case of one qubit, you could prepare it in the superposition of the two allowed configurations, z11. For n qubits, it can be a superposition of two to the power n states. So this ability to create this system in a superposition of all of these two to the power n states is can be in some can in some cases be exploited to achieve exponential speed up in particular computations. So this is also referred to as quantum parallelism, and this is one of the one of the key features which allows quantum computers to be faster in some cases than classical computers. There's this other phenomenon called entanglement. So just to appreciate it, let's say instead of one qubit, you have two qubits. We could prepare it in a state which looks like this. Uh, so take an online question. Okay. Do we know initial state of the qubit? And can we kind of apply it? Yeah, that's a great question. So indeed, how we define uh, repeat it for here. Okay, so the so the question is that do we know the initial states of the qubits and can we fix it? So that's a great question. Uh, indeed, we in the model of computation that we define, so which is also referred to as circuit model of computation. If anyone's interested, you can look it up. The idea is that you always start off with a defined initial state, which is the zero state. And there's a particular way, and we know how to always initialize our qubits in that state. And one of the easiest ways is to wait long enough. So, uh, but, but okay, that's a detail. But the point is that we always know how to make our qubits in a zero state and then do our computations. So, yes, we start from a different initial state. Okay, so we can prepare two qubits in this particular state. So, so and what this state implies is that the individual qubits don't no longer have an identity of themselves. They are intricately linked to the state of the other. So what this state means is, if I measure first qubit to be the state zero, I can be sure that the other state instantaneously goes to the state one. And if I measure the first qubit to be the state one, this means that the other qubit will instantaneously go to state zero. And what's surprising is that this phenomena does not require these two qubits to be close to each other or local. Well, to prepare them in this particular state, you need them to be close to each other. But once they are in this state, and this has been demonstrated experimentally, you can take these two systems far away from each other, even to, you know, like diametrically opposite points on the Earth. And you can still observe this correlation that if you measure this first qubit to be in state zero, you can be absolutely sure that the other qubit goes to state one. So, so this, this is also referred to as spooky action at a distance. And uh, this is something which we now understand and this is actually used to perform something called quantum communication. So, okay, just to summarize, quantum mechanics is observed or explains the world, the microscopic world. And there are some quantum effects which we observe there, which we do not see in our normal classical world. Uh, we observe that the energy is quantized Sometimes we don't we don't actually talk about this, but this is also a very interesting experiment which you can look up. It's called the double state experiment. It, it implies that sometimes particles behave like waves where we don't expect them to. Uh, they exhibit this this property of superposition where they can be in more states than one at the same time, and this and they can be in states that are entangled, which which uh, leads to them these states being correlated even when they are far away. Okay, so that's that seems rather uh, weird or not very intuitive, but here's what here's all we need to understand from the last few slides. Quantum mechanics is a mathematical description of the, math of the microscopic world. We do understand quantum mechanics to a great degree, which means that we have used it very very effectively. We have understood a lot of a lot of systems and we have made some insane predictions, which are very very accurate. What is kind of uh, we struggle a little bit is the interpretation of this thing, which has to do with the speculations of what is actually happening at the microscopic stage level, which leads to information being uh, conveyed in this probabilistic fashion. But that's that's not what we have to worry about. All we need to understand is we understand the mathematics and we can do many things with it. 
and it has immense predictive power and it has led to some the creation of some landmark technology so this is a transistor and this forms the basis of all modern computers and we could only invent the transistor because of our understanding of our quantum mechanical understanding of the electronic structure of silicon and because of that we could make a transistor and that's the only reason we can all carry really really powerful computers and all this stuff like uh, in today's world because of our understanding of nuclear fission in our nuclear plants which can harness this to generate energy uh, magnetic resonance imaging is now a tool which is indispensable to the medical community uh, it allows us to uh, image organs and tissues in great detail and that's only possible because we understand how protons behave in the presence of large magnetic fields moreover these large magnetic fields are generated using these coils which are in this uh, which are running around the mri and we need to supply really really large currents in these coils to generate these high magnetic fields and that's only possible because of this phenomena called superconductivity and this this phenomena has been deeply quantum mechanical origins the same phenomena allows us to make transmons which i am also going to call quantum pendulums which allows electronic circuits which can which are free of any dissipation of or any resistive energies so before we jump into quantum pendulums let's just briefly visit uh, this phenomenon of superconductivity so superconductivity was discovered by gamma ling onus in 1911 so if you take a, take a piece of metal and you and you <laughs> supply a voltage across it the current which will which will be drawn through this piece of metal will be proportional to this voltage and this is called the ohms law and uh, this is what you would expect and this is what typically happens and this proportionality constant is called the resistance or rather the ratio between the voltage that you apply and the current that is drawn is called the resistance so the lower the resistance the higher the current drawn and vice versa so tamerling on this decided to measure or study the pro this property the resistance of a block of solid uh, mercury and see how it varies with temperature and what he observed was something rather remarkable He observed that below a critical temperature, in this case 4.2 Kelvin, which is quite cold, uh, but nevertheless, what he observed was the resistance sharply dropped to zero. And this is not something which we expect. We do not expect the sharp change. What we expect is uh, this graph. If you see, if you had an ideal pure metal, uh, the resistance should slowly approach zero and should only reach zero when we reach zero Kelvin. For a real metal, or the metals which we find in the real world, this would never happen because uh, you never have pure metal. There's always some impurities. So even at zero Kelvin, you would have some finite resistance. But what what he observed, and and now what we call a class of materials called superconductors, what happens is below a transition temperature, the resistance sharply drops to zero. Now, and this allows dissipation-free currents. So. Uh, there's no resistance, so you can, in principle, send extremely large currents without them experiencing any dissipation. Now, what is the cause of this this dissipation in the first place? So, electrons, which are the charge carriers, uh, when uh, in conductors, which uh, when we when we supply any current, what happens is they collide with the lattice of the metal, and these collisions lead to them uh, dissipating heat in, into the into the, system, uh, into the environment. And this phenomena is also called Joule heating. And this is in fact useful in some cases. For example, the filament bulb only works because when we supply large currents through the filament, the filament heats up, and after a particular temperature, it starts emitting light. Uh, so, so it is useful in some cases. But nevertheless, this phenomenon is what leads to every conductor having some finite resistance because all the charge carriers are going to interact with the lattice and collide with it. But under very special circumstances, what can happen is that these electrons. can interact with the lattice in a particular way and they can they can experience an effective interaction between two electrons uh, in such a way that they they experience some sort of an attraction between each other which is very non intuitive you would expect two electrons to repel each other because they were negatively charged but in the presence of a lattice and under very special circumstances they experience an effective interaction which allows them to pair up into something called two pairs and these two pairs are bosons And they follow bosonic statistics as opposed to electrons, which follow fermionic statistics. 
And once you cool them down below a particular critical temperature, they form something called a post Einstein condensation. And this state is what allows the group of pairs to move without any resistance. Okay, so if this last part did not make any sense, that's fine. That was intended. What is important is to appreciate we have these class of materials which can exhibit dissipation free currents. And the origins of this current is deeply quantum. Uh, the origin of this dissipation free current or this uh, or this phenomenon of supernovativity is deeply quantum. That's all we need. Yeah. So, like, uh, these, these uh, I, sorry, can, can you can you repeat the question? Uh, like we are uh, we are using this uh, method, huh. and uh, we are super close to the So the question is that uh, uh, so when we when we cool down these metals, the lattice actually shrinks because we know that. Uh, uh, or, or, or the question is that the lattice shrinks, and is that why we see low resistance at low temperatures? Uh, that is oh, that is not the reason why that happens. Uh, there is this particular uh, relation which. Uh, I mean, there's a particular way you can model these metals, uh, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure of the details, but that is not the reason. Uh, there's a particular mathematical way of showing that this can happen, but I really don't have an intuitive understanding of why they expect that. Maybe we will discuss it later. Okay. Okay, so uh, so the question is uh, the at a particular temperature or, or a particular energy of the electrons, they occupy uh, the Fermi levels up to a particular up to, up to a particular level and form the Fermi surface. So, how do the electrons actually jump above that energy and conduct? Okay, so the whole idea is that in superconductors, they are no longer formulas. So when two electrons attract each other in a particular way, well, not attract each other, but experience an effective interaction, attractive interaction. They can pair up and form these particles, which are called Cooper pairs, which then follow bosonic cycles. So you can no longer think of them as filling up the Fermi scene, but you think of them as occupying levels in, in much the same way as bosons do. And it can be shown, or uh, it can be shown that below a particular critical temperature, they form something called Bose Einstein condensates, which is nothing but a macroscopic occupation of the bonds. Now, in this state, when everything has a collective wave function in the ground state, is a special state in which they can experience no resistance from the lattice, which the electrons initially experienced. And this, because they form the state, they can flow without any resistance and therefore the electrons. Does that make sense? So the question is that in, in reality, electrons never uh, move under a constant potential. There's always uh, some some fluctuations. That's only an average picture which we paint. That uh, there's a there's a constant potential and electrons move under it. Will this 
the absence of this ideal picture cause any problems for us? That's the question. So, in my understanding, no, we can still basically use the same understanding. And uh, well, well, this concept is something very different than the, 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 the average picture of it experiencing a constant potential is a very classical picture. Uh, to understand superconductivity, you need to do some quantum mechanical calculations. And uh, but once in that state, uh, I think uh, we can again think of uh, everything in this average. So that, that, that doesn't cause a problem. Okay. Uh, I guess I will move ahead. So just to summarize again, uh, there's a phenomenon of superconductivity which allows dissipation free currents, and the origins of this phenomenon are deeply important. That's all we have to Okay, so now let's let's get to the point. So let's think of this very simple circuit. Which is called an LCR oscillator. A capacitor is nothing but two, uh, two pieces of conductor placed very close to each other. And by the virtue of being close, uh, they, can, they can store some energy in the form of electric fields between these two plates. So if you supply some charge on one plate, it will induce uh, an equal and opposite charge on the other plate, and it will lead to formation of some electric fields between the capacitors, and that can store energy in this form. Similarly, an inductor is nothing but a coil and it can store energy in the form of currents. When these currents flow through these coils, it leads to some formation of magnetic fields between them. And uh, so, so, so that can also contain uh, energy in the form of currents. Now, let's say we join, uh, let's say we connect a capacitor, the, the two conductor, uh, the two uh, conducting plates of capacitor via this uh, inductor and a resistor. And we there's, there's some charge which is already present at the capacitor, and we close the switch uh, at equal to zero. So because of this electric field, uh, there's a finite potential difference between this point and this point on the capacitor. And because now we've made a galvanic collection, uh, connection, the charges will like to flow via this path. And slowly what will happen is that the charges will start flowing uh, because of the presence of this potential difference, and this charge will now start getting converted into current. So essentially what's happening is that the energy is getting transferred from the capacitor to the inductor. And this will happen till there is no charge, there's no potential uh, difference, or there's no charge on this capacitor. And all of the energy is now fully transferred from the capacitor to the inductor. But what will happen at that stage is that this current will now start depositing charge on the capacitor plates and the capacitor will start charging again. So the energy will get transferred from the capacitor to the inductor and then back to capacitor and this exchange will keep on happening. However, every time the current passes through this resistor, as we just uh, as we just started, uh, it will experience some dissipation. So it will dissipate some energy to the environment by the resistor. And what will happen is that these oscillations will continue, but over time, as we keep dissipating a little more of energy to the environment, the oscillations will finally stop. Yeah, so the energy sloshes back and forth between the capacitor and the inductor, but it experiences dissipation by the resistor, and eventually the oscillations will stop. So this is very similar to what we observe in a classical pendulum. So, okay, we already had this pool, but are you guys all familiar with what a classical pendulum is? It is basically a bob which is suspended by a thread. And the oscillations of this, or the frequency of oscillations, and this frequency is basically related to how much time it takes to go from one extreme to the other and back. This depends on the length of the length of the string. So if the length of the string is very small, you notice that you notice that the oscillations are fast. So I can take it to the extreme. This is unambiguously faster than this. So the oscillation frequency depends on the length. And what's essentially happening is that when I take the pendulum to one extreme, I'm basically charging it with gravitational potential energy, like the capacitor. And once I release it, this potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy when it reaches the, the lowermost point. And when it reaches the other extreme again, again, this kinetic energy is converted into potential energy. So in much the same way, the energy keeps getting exchanged between these two forms, the kinetic energy and the potential energy. However, uh, a pendulum also experiences resistance in the form of friction and uh, air resistance. So over time, 
it keeps dissipating energy into the environment, and that is when our oscillations finally start. So, so, so we need to appreciate that these two processes are very similar. And what that implies is that mathematical equations which will describe these processes will have a very strong mapping to each other. What's also important, or rather, uh, um, yeah, important to appreciate at this stage is that the restoring force which a pendulum experiences at this point is of the form mg sine. Now, this form leads to it being called uh, an anharmonic oscillation. Now, that means it is something which is not harmonic. Now, what does harmonic mean? It means that if, if the restoring force was proportional to just theta instead of sine theta, so sine theta can be expanded in this form. If you're, uh, if you're aware, if you're not, that's fine. Uh, or it, it, it can basically be represented as theta minus theta cubed by three, and then there's some higher order terms. So it was, if this was just theta, you can show mathematically that irrespective of what amplitude I start off with, the frequency of the oscillations, if the length of the string is the same, the frequency of the oscillations would be the same. But because this is sine theta, as theta increases, it the difference from theta increases. So you can see that as the amplitude increases, it takes more time to cover uh, this whole uh, trajectory as opposed to if it was you know, very small. I mean, it's not it's not really useful here, but you can show it. And this is what makes it nonlinear or anonymous. Okay, so just to summarize. Uh, it experiences a restorative force, which is of the form sine theta, which is an harmonic because it is not theta. And what all that implies is that if you if you increase the energy of the pendulum or make the amplitude larger, uh, the frequency will drop as you increase the amplitude. That's all it means. Okay. So the phenomenon of superconductivity allows us to create oscillators which are dissipation free. So in the previous example of LCR oscillator. If we invoke superconductivity, we can completely get rid of that resistive aspect. So what that allows us to do, uh, okay, so this is one particular schematic of such a circuit. So this contains a capacitor and a special kind of conductor, which I'll soon talk about, but you can essentially think of it as the same circuit where the inductor is something slightly special and there is no resistance. But the absence of this resistance allows these oscillations to go on for very, very long times. So there is no way for it to dissipate energy into the environment essentially and this exchange between these two modes can keep on happening and this absence of dissipation is what essentially allows us to observe for mechanical effects now this special kind of inductor is something which is called a josephson junction it is made up of two superconductors separated by a thin insulator uh, so there is an entire you know just to just to study this effect is completely a different uh, talk but all we need to appreciate is that the relationship between the current which is passing through this inductor with phi, which is the magnetic flux which is threaded through the junction when this current passes, follows this relationship, which is phi is some high critical sign phi. And this is exactly analogous to the restoring force which the pendulum experiences, which are on which is of the kind sign theta. And in, in exactly the same way, this makes this oscillator nonlinear. And you will observe, you will observe the same phenomenon that as we put uh, this oscillator in higher and higher energies, the frequency decreases. And now, since we're talking about the quantum mechanical regime, we will think of energies being discrete, and we can we can observe experimentally the spectrum, the quantum mechanical spectrum of such a system. And what we observe is that uh, the lowest transition between the states where the oscillator has no energy. And the oscillator has the lowest allowed energy. That transition is larger than the transition between the first and the second excited state. And the origin of this anharmonicity is this exactly the same as the one which we saw in the pendulum. And this is the reason I'm calling this system a quantum pendulum. Now, is there a question? Oh, yeah. So now, since we have this system, we can essentially think of this as an artificial atom because it has levels which are discrete and these the spacing between these levels is something that changes okay uh, so the question is how is this l different uh, from the first l which we saw in the previous slide 
Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so that L is something which we call a linear enough. And what we mean by linear is that the potential difference which is generated across the inductor when we apply a current is proportional to the current. So L is, so the delta V is basically L I and this L is the proportionality constant. And this means uh, because the potential difference is proportional to I, we are calling this relationship linear. So this L is a linear inductor. However, in this case, I've mentioned that this L is now a function of I. So your inductance will change depending on how much current you're supplying to. And that is what makes it normal. And that's what makes it. Normal. So now this whole system, which, uh, which is actually comprised of many, many atoms and molecules. So it has, it is basically an electronic circuit, which is uh, of like a few hundred nanometers of, this junction is a few hundred nanometers. And this whole system is, uh, is bigger than that. So it, it basically it comprises of uh, many, many atoms and molecules, but it effectively behaves like one large artificial atom. And that's, and that's, that's something very interesting and surprising. And now, since we have this spectrum, we can use the same idea and encode our information in these lowest two states, which is the zero state, uh, which is the lowest, uh, the zero oscillator state and the first allowed uh, excited energy. First allowed energy of the oscillator. And we can use these two states to form our qubit, which we talked about some slides back. But in order to have the ability to even access these states, we need to address another thing. We need to address the concept of temperature. So now, what does it mean uh, if that an object has a particular temperature? So we have our common element called macroscopic understanding of temperature, hotness, and coldness. But it turns out that you can have a microscopic definition of temperature. And this microscopic definition exactly translates to our understanding of temperature in the, in the microscopic world. So all this means is that when an object is at a particular temperature, its energy levels are filled uh, with excitations by this particular rule. So, the, so as we cool down the temperature, as, as we lower the temperature, as the temperature goes down, the, this exponential becomes sharper and sharper. And the probability of us finding uh, some some excitations in higher energies becomes lower and lower. And so so in real systems, we know what this transition frequency is, which relates to this energy Ti, and that is around five gigahertz. And this corresponds to a temperature of about 250 uh, millikelvin. And so in order to so, so basically this is what we want to do. We want we want to encode information in these two lower states. What are these two lower states? One in which our quantum pendulum has no oscillations at all and one in which it has the lowest possible amount of energy in its oscillations. So in order to even prepare it in this state of it having no oscillations, we need to ensure that temperature or there is no thermal population in these states. And for that, we can compute what, what temperatures we need to be to actually access these states. And so since this transition corresponds about 240 kelvin, we need to be at least an order of magnitude lower than that. And what allows us to do this is our cryogenic setup and more specifically, this, this machine, which you must have seen in the poster, and this is called a dilution refrigerator. And this machine, how cool it is. Okay, so, so just to give you a scale, scale, like outer Kelvin, scale. 77 Kelvin, yeah. temperature, some temperature scale. Okay, so 273 Kelvin is the freezing point of water. 77 Kelvin is the boiling point of nitrogen, if you're aware, if you're aware, work with the nitrogen. Outer space, as a temperature of about 2.4 Kelvin. So this is more than 100 times colder than the space, which is remarkable, I would say. Okay, so this machine, which is called a dilution refrigerator, uh, it uses a particular thermodynamic process. It uses a mixture of liquid helium-3 and helium-4. Uh, what refrigerator is this? A dilution refrigerator. Yeah, so what it, so it uses a particular process and essentially what happens is that there are these various stages of cooling. The first stage is at 55 Kelvin, the second plate is at 4 Kelvin, and successively these plates keep getting older. And finally, this base plate where we actually do our experiments is at 10 mK. And our quantum pendulums or the transmons are typically housed inside these 3D metal cavities. So 
So this is what a transform actually looks like. You can see a size scale. This is about 200 microns. Uh, one micron is 10 to minus six meters. Uh, so that, that green bar is 0.2 millimeters. Yes. Yes. So yeah. So so basically, these are you can see these chips with your naked eye. You can't see the junction, but you can see these devices. Uh, so, so these chips are placed inside these 3D cavities, and this cavity is mounted to the base plate, which is at 10 mm Kelvin. And this ensures that the whole that your, your device compromises to the same level. Uh, so because the question is transform any kind of positive part fields, the answer is wrong, and that's that's a separate concept. So right now we just have to think of this as a quantum mechanical system, which has a discrete spectrum which we are trying to access. That's all. It is not a, just think of it as a particular system. Particles are excitations which occur in quantum systems, but that's not a completely different story. So just think of it as a quantum mechanical system, which the energies of which we can access. Okay. Um, right. So in order to, okay, so now, uh, so obviously when we uh, do these experiments, this is an opened up dimension bridge. When we do the experiments, it is all has to be closed up, put in vacuum, and and, and we have to take many precautions. So, in order to do any experiments, in order to prove any properties of this quantum pendulum, you need to make some connection of this 10 mini Kelvin volt, 10 mini Kelvin volt to the outside world, which is at 300 Kelvin, which is where we sit and our equipment sits. So, we need to ensure that this connection to the outside world does not destroy the quantumness of, uh, of our system. It's clearly, in our world, in the normal world, we do not see quantum mechanical effects. And it has the ability to decohere, it's a technical term, but it basically has the ability to destroy the quantum mechanics. So this cavity kind of plays like does one important role in that it protects our qubit or our or our transmon uh, from from this connection to the outside world. Uh, moreover, this connection to the to the 300 Kelvin volt can lead to some uh, electrical noise. Yeah. Okay, so the question is why are there different plates for different uh, temperatures? So that's actually what I was going to talk about now. That's a good question. So, okay, to, to actually explain it, we have to visit this concept called uh, Johnson noise. Have you ever heard of that term? Okay, no worries. All that means is that if you take a piece of metal and measure the voltage across it, you will measure some random value, which will not be zero. But if you keep noting down these voltages and you average them out, you will get an average value of zero. However, now if you take the square of these voltages and then you average them, it will have some finite root mean square value. And this is called the Johnson noise. And this is some finite voltage fluctuations just by the virtue of the motion of electrons because of the temperature they are at. So this Johnson noise has a particular relationship to the temperature. Now, if we take some equipment which is at 300 Kelvin and you make an electrical connection to our device which is at 10 mm Kelvin. The electrical noise or the Johnson noise, which is at 300 Kelvin, will completely, you know, uh, destroy the quantumness of the system. So what we do is we attenuate this joint, uh, this noise. So we add, use something called an attenuator, which suppresses both what we are sending and and this noise. But now, if the attenuator itself is at some temperature, it will suppress the noise at 300 Kelvin, but add noise of the temperature it is at. So let's say I add an attenuator at 55. So it will suppress most of the noise which is coming from 300 Kelvin, uh, but it will add Johnson noise which we expect at 55 Kelvin. So even the noise from 55 Kelvin is not good for our system. So this is a clever way of just designing an experiment. You add, you have attenuators at each stage, and at each stage it attenuates the Johnson noise of the previous stage and adds the noise of its own temperature. So finally, when you are experiment, when you're doing an experiment, the only electrical noise which our system experiences is that from 55 Kelvin. And that is something which is not, uh, you know, that is not harmful for the experiments. And that's something. So that's why you have these stages. But whatever is happening there, fine, you see the thing, but otherwise, all my experiment is gone. I cannot see the things happening there. 
but I cannot calculate the thing which is happening here. So there must be something which is passing on from this to my output world. How this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so, so the question is how can we actually observe yeah. what is happening there? Okay, so so what we mean by seeing what is happening is uh, is so essentially what I'm talking about these electrical connections that we are making from the outside world. These there are wires which go in and there are wires which come out, and we can protect this system from these harmful sources in the same way. But what we can essentially do is we can send electrical signals which go and interact with your system in a particular way, and they can get reflected and then come back. And depending on how they have changed from the initial state to the final state. We can extract the information of what your 10 million gem moment is at. Each time you have to so not like that. So basically, this whole setup ensures that your signal can go and interact with your system without without while ensuring that it is still quantum mechanics. So so it doesn't uh, so all it all you need to do is you need to see how your signal has changed. So what has happened to it once it interacted with the system after it came back? And this change in the signal tells us what is happening in that 10 million. And you can do very precise information. Yeah. To say what is the signal that you're taking in and what are you seeing when you take out? Okay, so so I was gonna come to that. Uh okay. Well, you come to that. Yeah, so so we'll see soon oh, in a slide. Uh so yeah, so in order to protect it from this electrical noise that we are talking about, we need these attenuators which I mentioned, and also some cryogenic filters, which basically filter what are. So you're basically sending some photons, which are of a particular frequency regime, a few gigahertz, which are called microwave photons, and you need to ensure that these are the only kind of photons which are interacting with the system. So you need some filters. And similarly, so this is the electrical noise, but there is also the ambient temperature, and we know black body radiation. All of these objects are emitting uh, some photons just by the virtue of being at some temperature. So we need to protect our system from those photons. And for that, we have things called microwave shielding. So when the system is actually set up, you have shieldings at all of these stages, which protect this 10 milli Kelvin moment from the radiation. Okay, so now you have this system, which you can prepare in a quantum mechanical way, you know, which can be put in a quantum mechanical state, and you can now do experiments with it. So it turns out that we can actually manipulate the quantum state. So once you define your zero and one state as the lowest levels, you can shine photons which are resonant with this transition. This means that if you shine photons of the same energy as the energy which corresponds to this transition, you can actually drive transitions between these two. And so we visit the block sphere again, you can you can actually prepare this quantum pendulum in all of the states, which we just saw in the in the quantum computing state. In the quantum computing state. So it can be prepared in the ground state. You can shine light for a particular amount of time, not light, like photons of the microwave region. Uh, and you can you can excite it to the one state. And now you can shine the same photons for like an intermediate amount of time. And you can you can actually prepare it in a superposition piece. It does not reach the one state, but it can be in some intermediate superposition. And uh, yeah, and this is, this is how you represent the superposition state. And we actually do, do, do routinely do these experiments. So this is data taken from a lab. So here you basically can imagine these x, y, z as coordinates of this of our qubit state on the block state. And uh, so where uh, where z equal to one means it is at the ground state, and z equal to minus one, let's say that means it is in the inside state on the north pole. And so we can actually observe. How the quantum mechanical state evolves with time as we shine light and shine full So we can we can absolutely control the quantum states of the system. So this is one cube. Maybe take this some Sorry. Back. Okay. Is it visible on screen? Yes. The last thing is okay. I see this is looking pretty good. Uh, okay, so that was one qubit. Now, what we can do is we can couple capacitively. Yeah. Yes. So that was. 
uh, okay, so the question is, how do we actually uh, control uh, this uh, uh, quantum state between the unknown? So this uh, this happens because of this particular uh, phenomena called Rabi oscillations. So it, so this phenomena is called Rabi oscillations. Yeah. So so you can show this mathematically that if you shine, uh, you know, uh, an oscillating wave of this frequency, you can essentially coherently drive your state from zero to one and back, and it will keep oscillating between these two states till you keep shining these two ones. So once it's oscillating, it has this trajectory. You can stop at any particular time, and it can clearly fix at that state. Well, our energy, so the energy of the quantum system is certainly oscillating between these two states. And yeah, uh, so the question is, uh, is our energy oscillating when we when we drive these oscillations, uh, drive these transitions between zero and one? So indeed, uh, uh, the energy of our quantum pendulum is being exchanged between these two allowed energies, which is the mode in which it has no oscillations and the state in which it has the lowest possible energy. And uh, and this exchange uh, between these two modes is something which is driven by an external entity, which happens to be our source of microwave. Sir, uh, that So now what this system offers is, is some infrastructure or, or, or like physical architecture to build these quantum mechanical systems in which you can do manipulations on single quantum states and single people states and multi people states. And this is a technology which we now call two electric qubits. And it has been demonstrated that these systems can be used to make quantum computers. So very recently, uh, so, so basically you can take many of these. So I just showed two, but in principle, you can take as many of these as you want, make them interact with each other, and if you can solve all the engineering problems, you can very you can uh, control the collective quantum state of the school system and do what is called quantum computation. And so IBM recently unveiled this quantum processor, which contains 127 qubits, and uh, it, which basically, so this is a picture of uh, how the chip actually looks. Uh, it is a lot of these electrical circuits which are coupled to each other in a particular way. It's a schematic of it that this is one transmon, this is another transmon, and they are coupled to each other in this way. And there's a lot of engineering challenges which are required to actually realize this uh, chips. Okay, that's a great question. The question is why do you require coupling to uh, make a processor? Okay, so the whole idea of quantum computation is to uh, 
to use these photomechanical phenomena, which is superposition and entanglement, as if it's some form of resources to do efficient computation. Now we we understand that in order to so we already saw superposition can be achieved in a single thing. So in principles, we don't need multiple people to demonstrate uh, superposition. But to just to, uh, to demonstrate entanglement, we need a multi-qubit system, and it can be shown that in order to make two quantum systems entangled with each other, they need to interact with each other. And to mediate this interaction, you need some coupling mechanism. So if you had two individual transforms, you could never put them in an entangled, entangled state if they never interact with each other. So to to ensure to have the ability to prepare this entanglement, you need to couple them. And if you want to generate entanglement in a large system like you know these 127 qubits, so you need to ensure that each qubit can talk to the other qubit in some way. Okay, so the yes. So it is uh, every port qubit is connected. So every port is connected to uh, the other port. Yeah. So the question is whether this is an actual uh, picture. So yeah, this is an actual picture of the chip. And this is a schematic which shows how the qubits are connected. So to, in total, there are 127 qubits, but not all of them are connected to each other. Uh, this is only connected to two of its neighbors. The maximum number of neighbors a qubit has is three, like here and here and here. But they can talk to these faraway qubits via interaction with the intermediate qubits. So, so there's ways to do this. In principle, you can use this. So you together to all will be connected by. Yeah, so what we are yes. and uh, so so it and, and these are not just uh, you know like demonstrations of physics. These machines have been used to solve some actual relevant problems. So there are some recent results. Uh, for example, our quantum computers can be used to do quantum chemistry simulations. Now, what does that mean? So uh, we just talked about the Schrodinger's equation in the initial part of the talk. So that same equation also describes how we expect molecules to form. And these systems, as the molecules grow larger and larger, uh, it is hard to solve this equation as the molecule gets bigger. So it is impossible to solve it mathematically or analytically, like on a piece of paper. But we solve a lot of these equations using our normal classical computers. So they are basically differential equations. And we use our normal computers to solve these differential equations and compute answers numerically. But as the molecule keeps getting bigger, the size or the memory which is required to do these calculations also grows exponentially. In a similar way, which we saw as the number of bits through the number of configurations grew exponentially. So in a similar way, uh, not exactly the same way, but I'll not talk about that. But in a similar way, as the, as the size of the molecule gets bigger, it gets harder and harder to simulate a normal classical computer. And uh, so beyond the stage, a classical computer can't do. However, if our quantum computers, since uh, they themselves be, uh, uh, follow the rules of quantum mechanics, you can efficiently simulate molecules on a quantum computer. So we are not at a stage currently where we can simulate molecules which are not possible to simulate on a normal computer. But nevertheless, there are some demonstrations that eventually when we have enough number of qubits, we can, we can actually achieve this. So for example, here they have simulated uh, an H2 molecule. And they've computed the energy which we accept, expect for the non state of the system uh, using a particular quantum algorithm. The details of which uh, feel free to explore in this reference. Uh, there have also been some demonstrations of quantum advantage. What we mean is uh, it is a stage where the quantum computer found the computation. In a much faster, uh, in a in a much more efficient way as compared to what we expect from normal computers. So, in this case, these are not actually computations which are relevant to some real problem. They are they are some arbitrary quantum circuit which was or some quantum algorithm which was applied. But nevertheless, if you had to simulate the same quantum circuit or algorithm on a normal computer, it would take you a much much longer time. So for example. Uh, I think uh, this chip compute, uh, made some computation in a, in a few hundred seconds, which you would expect a classical computer to take you know, tens of thousands of years. But these computations are right now not relevant to real world problems, but nevertheless, they are 
key demonstrations that we are making progress in this area. Okay, just to summarize the summarize the talk till now, or just to summarize the talk, we first talk about quantum mechanics, which is a mathematical description of the microscopic world. It it gave rise to some or predicted and uh, explained some phenomena which we do not observe in our normal science world, uh, namely uh, superposition of entanglement. Uh, then we talked about superconductivity, which is a macroscopic manifestation of the same quantum, quantum mechanics. So it, it, it required the physics of wave functions and quantum mechanics, and but actually translated to some you know, uh, things we can macroscopically understand, like currents and voltages. And then we, we took this connection of the quantum mechanical world with the macroscopic world to make something called superconducting circuits, which are basically electronic circuits, uh, which are cooled down to very, very low temperatures to make dissipation free electronic circuits. And because of that reason, they exhibited quantum behavior despite being macroscopic, despite being big. And then we talked about how these systems can be used to make quantum. We talked about some of the achievements which at this stage we have. Thanks a lot. This is a picture of our lab for the laboratory, PIR part. And here are some references if you want to read more about this talk. And I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan for really helping me prepare this talk. And also Madhvi, Palas, Arnav uh, for the organization also helping me prepare. And, I would also like to thank God for the way to prepare the poster for this talk. Questions? Uh, we also have some think of your questions. We'll take the questions which are online. Uh, okay, so first, maybe if I stand here, you can get yeah. stuff and you'll hear as well. Uh, So, is there a particular Mita asks, is there a way to prepare entangled qubits? Okay. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, there is a way to prepare entangled qubits. In fact, that is something which is not routinely done. You can take as few as two qubits. And uh, so, so there's a particular, there, there's a few ways you can do it. One standard way, which we also do in our lab, is uh, let's say I can go back to this slide, is you can take system which is like this, you have two transforms that are coupled with each other, and this transform can have some frequency, and this transform can have some frequency, and you can shine photons on these two transforms in a particular way, uh, which which you can actually, uh, uh, you can study this mathematically using quantum mechanics, and it can be demonstrated that if you do that, uh, you can prepare this system of two transforms in an entangled state, and you can also perform measurements which will characterize uh, how strong this entanglement is. So yeah, you can indeed prepare two qubits in an entanglement. Okay, Rishit asks, how do you achieve cooling below four Kelvin? Oh, that's a uh, very good question. Maybe others want to ask this. Yeah, so, so what I was talking about, uh, so there is this, uh, essentially this mechanism called, uh, so, so this is called a dilution refrigerator because it invokes a particular uh, thermodynamic process to achieve this cooling to such low temperatures. So you can think of it analogous to how we cook soup. So when once you have hot soup and you blow over the soup, it creates a pressure differential on top and that makes uh, uh, water evaporate from the soup into the air. And via the virtue of this evaporation, it takes some energy from the soup and it pulls it down. So in a similar way, you have a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4 which is running in a circuit through all of these, uh, through this entire direction, uh, bridge. And we create a pressure differential on one side, which makes uh, in helium three or, or one of these evaporate out and then we pump it back on the other side. And it keeps performing this action where this, uh, uh, the mixture is extracted from, uh, uh, so, so helium three, I think is extracted from the mixture and pumped back in. And as you keep continuing this process, this, uh, this evaporation keeps uh, pumping energy out of your system and it comes down to the very Okay, so the dilution is a dilution of helium 3 and helium 4. Twice of the helium 3. Uh, 
Aminav asks, this is a bit. Okay. What is the scope of quantum teleportation for transmitting information over arbitrary distances? Uh, you can say it's not related to the compass, so it's fine. But okay, so the question is, uh, you are saying you could quantum teleportation, which would then you take these qubits uh, across the two ends of the earth and if you right. see that one is in a zero state, you are immediately aware that the other one was. Yeah. So, so, well, actually, quantum teleportation is in fact a technical term at this point where uh, it, it is related to entanglement, but uh, from what I understand, uh, uh, it cannot be actually used to transmit any information instantaneously. It still follows the same laws which we expect, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, which are expected from material relativity that information cannot be transferred beyond a particular speed limit. But nevertheless, uh, it has been demonstrated that you can do stuff like quantum key distribution. You can look it up if you're interested, where you can perform communication in a secure way. So rather than speeding up the communication by a quantum teleportation, you can make it more secure because your system is now uh, very, very sensitive to interaction from the outside. So that is one application. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, okay, now we take questions from here. But just before we take the questions, uh, yeah, we will basically end the Zoom meeting and we will take uh, questions here because the online audience doesn't get shy. Uh, okay, so let's do one thing. Uh, I'll just come here. So, formally, let's just thank Jay once more. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Take, take, take.